And our next pr presentation continues this theme about the role of communities and about how do we engage people from those communities. And it's Virginia and Jane and Daniel Conte from the Celestine Celeste Community Organization, who are a not-for-profit organization, which was founded in 2013 to facilitate the awareness and effects of female genital mutilation. Locally, nationally, and internationally, they are a vocal prosecutor for female genital mutilation, believing that female genital mutilation is an act of misogyny, violence against women, children, and a violence, violation of human rights. So if I can hand over. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I first would like to thank all the women, all the men, all the children that are living with the consequences of female genital mutilation. It is child abuse. It takes the right to our body. We have a right to have a healthy sex life. Women have a right to choose what's happening to their body. FGM shouldn't have a stand in the 21st century. It has to stop. I'd like to thank the wonderful lady over there, to thank Efio, Leila Hussein. I'd like to thank the Coventry Public Health, Gillian Squire, the detective over there, for the work they have done to get communities like ourselves involved. We are a non-for-profit organization. We don't get paid. We do this out of passion, out of the fact that it has to stop. There is no way that it should go on. However, people are missing out on the fact of the big role that is played by the community. As a woman, most people will think that as an African woman, I do not have a stand. I do not have, I can't say what I want. I can't say what I need. I'm abused. I can't come forward. It's different when we are behind doors. In most of the African cultures, women are the leaders. My husband listened to me. I can walk 10 steps behind him in public. But when we go home, he listens to me. I make decisions. And unfortunately, what professionals do not understand is that African women, we are strong and we are fortunate. When we come to countries like the UK, we are the first to be granted asylum. We are the first to have access to funds. We are the first to be noticed by authorities. That changes the role in our families. That changes what our husband and our men knows. We become the person in power. We control finance. And it needs to be said, African women need to take responsibility to stop FGM. We have to take a stand. We have to say, we earn the money. We have double roles as African women. We have children that we leave at home. We are still fending for those children. It's an extended family. If my husband is stuck between the asylum-seeking system, I, as a woman, most of the African women are in health. If you look at the recent research done by BRAP, it highlights how many African women are in the health system. We end the manifest. The roles have changed. What's stopping us from saying no to FGM? Absolutely nothing. Our communities are depending on us as women. And unfortunately, we need to take responsibility and accountability. We need to stop passing the bark. FGM is not just concentrated on any other countries. FGM is alive and happening in South Africa. It has been for a very long time. But unfortunately, the African continent, most of the things that are needed are marred by the political issues happening. FGM is happening in South Africa. I would like to talk to the health professionals. I am a health visitor. 
I've been a nurse in the community. I've nursed in intensive care. I've been a midwife. I've done it. I've been in mental health. Unfortunately, the health system doesn't understand our culture. When we go for training, we have equality and diversity. There isn't any since I've been in this country for 19 years that I have been exposed to African culture, and we need to stand up to that. When you have a lady walking into your office, or a service user walking into your office, and this lady has undergone FGM, and the first thing you say to this lady is, have you undergone FGM? And the lady says, no. Have you been caught? What's that? Unfortunately, even the health professionals, there's a big problem with the terminology. As African, as a mom myself, and as an African woman, when FGM came to force, and everyone was talking about female genital mutilation, among our communities, we spoke about it. We were offended. We got used to it. And now everyone is talking about circumcision. Among our own communities, when we talk about circumcision, they will say, actually, it's changed from genital mutilation. That means it's okay, because circumcision is sooner. Understand our language. In the video that you guys have watched today, there's something that most African women and African men do. We speak with our hands. We are loud. We have different facial expressions. As a health professional, as a school teacher, know those. If you have a lady you're talking to about the infibulation, do not class that as just a subject of the infibulation. It's my sexual health. It's my marriage. Our man, you'll hear from Daniel when he's going to talk about how FGM and the perspective among African communities. Our husband has to come to us after we've had the infibulation and deal with a different vagina. I have to go home and deal with a different vagina. Yeah, the infibulation is good, but what system are there to support us as a community? We want to take responsibility. We want to get engaging. We want to understand the law, border control. We want to understand what is meant when they say our children are going to be checked. I have a daughter of 12. I'll never cut my daughter. I practice Islam. I'm a Catholic as well. I'll leave that to you guys. <laughs> my history, my family history is complex. I have a strong FGM history, even though I was born and bred in South Africa. I'm married to a man that 100% FGM. My daughter's father is 100% FGM uh, community. That doesn't mean that when I go through your door, as someone who's pregnant or someone who's coming, I'm not at risk of FGM. That curtain should be wide open. My race, where I come from, doesn't really detect to you that I'm going to have FGM or I'm going to subject my daughter to that. Be weary. My hijab, when I'm wearing a hijab, doesn't mean that even though I'm an, I, I practice Islam, I'm for FGM. If I'm going through border control and they're telling me my daughter is going to be checked, however, what are, what are we doing as professionals, as the government, to educate the communities? How can we sit here and implement social change when our community doesn't understand what the law says, what safeguarding means, what child protection means, the infibulation, what does it mean? What I see is, okay, I'm going to have a different vagina. My marriage is gone. We are grateful, do not get me wrong, but we are saying we are here. See us, use us, come to ask. Ask, we will answer. Our men are getting involved. And our services, unfortunately, they are not flexible. Dana will explain further. They do not cover the times that is needed from our African communities. It takes us a long time to get into the workforce. It takes us a long time to be able to fend for ourselves, to buy food, to be proud parents. And remember, we have children at home. The police, I would like really to commend the police. Coventry, Gillian, she works with us. She's happy to come out of her comfort zone 
sacrificed her time to come to our communities and talk to us about FGM. We want to understand the law. We want to make informed decisions. We have a right to make informed decisions. How do you expect someone to make an informed decision when they do not understand the law? FGM is not culture. It's not religion. We can go about that for the whole day. We know it's not. We know we do it for different reasons. We know some of us are sticking to it simply because it's the only thing that as an asylum seeker you can take from me. The victims are getting younger, ladies and gentlemen. There's a big gap in the NHS between the midwife, the time when I'm seen by the midwife, and the time when the baby is seen by the health visitor. And the health visitor is not there 24-7. After that baby has been checked six weeks, it will be the eighth week, the, the eight months check. There's a lot of time that is left and children are not checked. However, talk to our children, talk to us. When I'm booked as a pregnant woman, I don't come on my own, I come with family. Remember how strong the community is. We have, as Africa, we have so many norms and values and habits that we have inherited from home. I still call Africa home, even though I've been here that long and I'm British. But home is still Africa. When I talk to my children, when they talk about home, they talk about Africa. When something goes wrong, I still pick up the phone and I call my mom. It's simply because she will reprimand them better than I do. That's what's happening in our communities. There is a vast number of people in the communities that are educated, that have knowledge. We have elders. We have carried this norm from home. We have elders within our communities that are accountable and responsible to counsel us, to address the problems in our marriage, the problems with our children. Are you aware of those people? Because those people are very powerful. They are not just in Africa, they are here. And unfortunately, they are missed. And those people have a mammoth knowledge of what can be done. Social change is not easy, but you can't do it on your own. You need us. You need us. You need to work with us. You need to ask us for help. We might not specialize in everything, but we have been in this country, and we are valuable. And the best thing about us is what? We are living the double culture. We understand you. You don't understand us. Why are we talking about changing the law if the people who are supposed to support different types of FGM, there's no curriculum. I did my health visiting training in 2012. There's no curriculum. There was nothing that was taught about FGM. The midwives themselves, why is there no policies in place? Why are every hospital doing the, making their own policies? When we talk about stopping FGM, we start with the community. In health, we talk about prevention is better than cure. You can't cure what people don't understand. You can't cure something that you don't look. When you look at the virus, you look at the mode. You look at how it's manifested. There are two things that I want to leave you gentlemen with and ladies. When HIV AIDS started, it was classed as an African problem. Now how much money, how much money are we investing to take the stigma away? When Stop and Search started, it was to keep us safe. It was done the wrong way. And now things are getting rectified. But at what price? FGM, stopping FGM, has a chance to start the right way instead of us standing here 10 years coming to look at how to stop the stigma. My color, where I come from, if I have been caught, it doesn't classify me or it doesn't, I don't have that label that I'm going to cut my child. If the border control can, can teach their staff to identify FGM, what's stopping health, what's stopping teachers, what's stopping communities knowing about it? Health professionals need to know how to ask questions. Health professionals need to understand our mode of communication. A little patience. We still think in our Vanek language. I have four languages that I speak. Sometimes when I get lost, I think in my Dwana or Tosa or Venda. And I will take a long way round to get to a point. Use services like ourselves. Hannah is 12, 
and she's going to be telling you guys what she's been doing at school because I didn't want to touch the school. But please, use communities. We are available and we can teach you. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Hannah Ringain and a student at St. Paul's Roman Catholic School for Girls. I remember when I was 10, my mom called me and said, Hannah, we need to talk. And at that moment, I had a panic attack. Did I clean my room? Finish my homework? God, please tell me what I have done wrong. However, all my fears vanished. But in place of that fear, there was an even worse terror, FGM. The words that she mentioned was, if I die, I want you to be safe and to realize what the world is really like. Now, of course, I was scared. I was terrified. Has something happened? But since I was terrified, I was horrified. I was just shocked. Never in my life have I heard of FGM not in commercials or in school. It has been completely shut off from the world with a way of automatically making the brain feel as if this particular subject is taboo. Why is that? That was the only question I could muster. Since I could not accept this abuse anymore, I set out to my school, phone call after phone call, Letter after letter, the school did not respond. So I, by myself, requested for Celestine Celeste. At first, they were recalled to introduce FGM. Was it too graphic? Did I really need to show this to the school? Would it make much difference? But my mother and I worked hard in order to create a good child-friendly presentation. Finally, we were accepted and given the opportunity to present in front of the school. I have done things like handing out leaflets to other students, presentations to different forms and to, whole, to the whole school, talking to students about female genital mutilation. And by doing this, we at Celestine Celeste learned that it can be better to take baby steps to reach our ultimate goal. Currently, we are at the stage where I am finally allowed to fundraise, which again could help us and the school community tremendously. Personally, I think that FGM is wrong. It is simple, it just should not be done. People do not realize how harmful female genital mutilation can actually be, both physically and mentally. In conclusion, I want to put an end, an end to all of this. But without the support of others, we at Celestine Celeste cannot do so. So I, Hannah Ringain, a member of Celestine Celeste, officially ask of you to partake in our goals and aspirations for a brighter future. Good afternoon all. I'm here to talk on behalf of the dead and to say I'm also a dad. We've heard about, we've had stories about um, a survival and now we've heard from the child. Now please hear my own story on behalf of the dads. In Africa, we misunderstood what is bad habit passed on generation upon generation to culture, to a point where if you look at the justification that they do give for FGM based on all what we've seen here today, some will tell you it's to discourage sex, some will tell you it's to prepare, I mean, the women for marriage. To us as African men, what we were told was totally different 
that lady's story, that survival story here just now, was so shocking equally to me, even as an African, as compared to anyone here who've never known about FGM. So that's our position as men from Africa. What we were told is that it is something decent, it is something that will prepare the women, it is something that will give you a better wife. And what we were failing to realize at that time was that what we saw as melody, that is the drummings, the singings, and the clapping was a catch. Everybody here that had gone through FGM will tell you, oh yeah, we were happy, we were singing. But that was a camouflage for us from the outside as men not to know actually what is going on. Because the drumming there, we realized later, was because they would be shouting of the pain, and that shout will be obstructed from the noise that will come from the clapping, the singing, and the drumming. So we will not hear anything that is going on. So as an African man, I do agree with what the video was saying about that man who said, um, it is about power to men. Yeah, because FGM varies. If I'm talking from the West African point of view, it is not so. To us, we were promised that these women are actually going to be prepared. And as any man in this room, you want to have a good wife anyway. And without knowing the violence, you would then go on to it. Coming to culture and bad habit, I believe as Africans, we are taking responsibility, as Virginia said. We are going to champion the cause. Yes, that's true. But we want you to understand that it was difficult as well for us because FGM was also not originated in Africa. It was taken there. What we know according to history is like some slave traders would use FGM as a, I mean, as a contraception to like just make their slaves, female slaves, more, more expensive so that they don't get pregnant and all the rest of it, so they will be well priced. Some will tell you, I mean, the genitalia there is, I mean, will look ugly and then they will try to like shave it off and all just to make it beautiful. And if you look at all this, it goes on generation upon generation until we are now independent, we are ruling ourselves. Four generations down the line, which is 400 years down the line, we saw it as a culture. We saw it as something like some sort of a good practice. But today, and like every other, any other African man in this room, or every other man in this room, I would say the stories that I've heard and what I saw, FGM must stop. And if we move from the cultural aspect of it and then we come to how we are going to look at it, it is not our responsibility to dictate the performance of FGM on our daughters. I am like any dad in this room who would love their daughter so much. And I am also aware and conscious of human rights. If not so in Africa, for the fact that I'm in a Western world, I would have to comply strictly with those rules here. But the decision for FGM comes from the women. It is not a man. It's a no-go zone. We don't discuss that one. It is non-negotiable. All you need to do is to be told about it that your daughter will be taken off this house for a particular period. And if you are less fortunate, you can actually fund the quality that is actually taking place on your own daughter. But this is actually done out of ignorance. It is actually done because we were not allowed to discuss it. If the woman realized that I'm a bit stiff about it, she would use not only her own mom, but my mom. And these three will come together, and there is no way I can stand here and say, I would like to see my mom prosecuted. It is a difficult, I mean, thing to do. That's one, I can justify that culture. In our culture, you don't speak so much when your parents are talking. So we left, that is how we are now being blamed. And why we are different with our community organization's approach is because we've realized that by sitting down, allowing new laws to come, and not saying something would not only try and create confusion, but it would actually cause break, a breakdown in even in our marriages. Because if I happen 
to sit by and allow my daughter because of cultural thing or because of bad habits which we now perceive as culture to happen to my daughter, I will be prosecuted. And on the other hand, that is how difficult it is. If I say I'm going to prosecute or like identify my wife or just tell the police that my wife and my mom are actually trying or going about to like um, 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 get FGM done on my daughter, it also places me in a very difficult position. So that is why we need to come. We took the initiative of talking to the men first. We know, yes, the women are empowered. They have power in England. That's fine. That's so, it's so it is in Africa as well. We know when it comes to kids, the man, we are only playing passive roles. All we do is being a dad. You go to work, you come from work, and then you are told something that happens when you are aware about your kids. We are also aware that, I mean, if you, 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 you are not told it can be done, and then you'll be, you'll be told later. But we are now talking and engaging our men. We are telling the African men about the new law, that it is not just now an offense that is fearful just to the women. It is also an offense to actually team up or just see and don't say anything about it. So that's one on that side the law is working. So it's like we engage these men, we tell them, don't do it. It is not a cultural thing. You cannot link culture to FGM. It is just absolute cruelty. You can actually replace the cutting of the FGM. If they think what they are doing in preparation or in preparing these women is good, well done. We are telling them, just tell them to take away the cutting. Drum beating, clapping, singing, that's fine. We are not against that one. It's about what they think. It's giving them happiness or that can make them clean in society. We are also asking as a group that whilst we are actually addressing or trying to address or trying to come up with a national model which can actually influence, I mean, the international, I mean, practice of, F of the eradication of FGM, we should also bear in mind that in as much as we as a community are ready to work together this time around, not to stay behind, we are asking the government or the lawmakers to be aware, again, that we were talking about victims here. We are forgetting that the quarters are actually having this as a job, and it is wrong that our president from Africa are actually coming to England and only for them to sign for a six million pound aid to promise that they are going to change the laws in Africa. And when they go there, they are being told by these quarters who are in this big number and they stand strong in society there. And there are grandmoms as well, don't forget that, will, be, will tell the president actually, if you say a word in your manifesto about the eradication of this one, we are actually going to refuse you the female vote. And for fear of that, when it comes to politics, politicians will actually want to get the vote to go in there and even make the difference in the first place because you can only make that difference if you have voted in. So that's how it dies down. So if we are coming up with a model like working together and this, I mean, having this, the, the collective approach, we should also bear in mind that, I mean, what is actually a bad trick or bad habit which we have now, I mean, which we now, I mean, see as, I mean, a culture can actually be dealt with in a very, very softly manner, wherein every spectrum of people who are going to be involved in that one will come together and then we'll do our contributions towards that. In Coventry, what we intend and what we've been doing in places like Birmingham, we are going to like have something where we would engage the men. We would tell them some of this. I mean, I mean the, the side effects of it, and we will tell them as well that, I mean, we've been fooled for a long time, and that we are now being looked at. We are almost criminalized for something that we are not even aware of in reality, so we don't sit by and then just keep quiet about that. And I can say to this conference here today that I only have one daughter, and I love her so much, and she's born here, she will never undergo that one, regardless of what pressure that is coming up. But I cannot stand here and guarantee for all other Africans if we don't educate them, if we don't engage them. They believe, I mean, every man will want to have a virgin anyway in reality. So they believe if you go through FGM through that way, I mean, you can be able to like get a better wife, a wife that will be you for the first time and all the rest of it. So if we try and tell them that, okay, if they are saying this is good, well, let's 
pick the good side of it, which is preparing the women, that's fine. I mean, allowing them to socialize in like clapping and drumming, that's fine as well. Just replace the courtier with something else like education. And on the government said, please try and begin to think about the quarters from the economic point of view. If we are passing laws now without engaging the community, what is actually happening? Like what Virginia was saying, that gap is where the game is playing. And for you to be guaranteed that, I mean, you would have a girl child that will walk up to the police and tell the police, my mom actually performed FGM on me in an African setting is very difficult. Because that means that child will be taken away from the parents, and that's the barrier in reality. So to stop that one, I think we need to like, get the parents involved, which is the focus of this conference here today. So I say that again, please don't judge us. These decisions are made by the women. It is actually, it has nothing to do with us other than just being informed. You would see that, I mean, it is going to be confrontational for myself and my mom. Culturally, we don't talk sex in Africa. We don't discuss it. So if I start talking about my, I mean, rejection to FGM, it's like I'm actually talking about sex in another form. Because I would have to justify myself, and that will force me to begin to tell them why FGM is wrong. It will force me to tell them about the sexual side of it. It will, tell me, it will force me to tell them about the private side of it. So please understand us, don't judge us as men or as dad. The women are responsible for this. But we are happy today that, I mean, today they are also aware of this one. Before in Africa, what you are seeing on there where women can actually stand in public and talk about FGM, they can't. The only side effect I know as a dad for FGM is if you come out and talk about it, you will die. That's the only side effect. Now I'm hearing about the medical effects. And when you discuss that with your partner who has undergone FGM and who is actually rooted in the practice of FGM, she would ask you a direct question. Is anything wrong with me or our marriage for the past 20 years? Are we not enjoying sex? So it's, as it varies country per country, so is the pain. Very as well. I mean, it's different, your experience, what you go through. So please don't judge us as African dads being part of this whole thing. We are also misinformed. And if something that is bad had been practiced year on, generation upon generation, some point along the line, it becomes something like a culture because we think, because in our own generation for the past 400 years, my great, 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 whichever way it ends, have gone through FGM. So we think it's normal. Until now, we're having this education. With technology, we are now enlightened. I saw the FGM practice on YouTube showed to me by Virginia, and I was shocked. And when I heard that lady's story, it was shocking. I will say no to that, and we would ensure that we are going to fight for that one, for African men to understand that FGM is wrong, but please don't judge us on that. We are not part of it, and we will not be part of it, and we'll fight as African men to support the women to just say no to our parents, because that is where the problem is. The culture, this cultural interpretation is with them. And don't forget Africa is playing catch up. We can't be up to date as you guys are here. We are only trying to like copy what you guys, what is good here, and then try to tell them. And this communication is a bit difficult for us, but it takes time, it will go down. So please, ladies and gentlemen, don't judge us, and thank you very much for listening.